Welcome to The Riff, where writer and investor Bern Hobart and I discuss the major inflection points caused by technological change. Our weekly conversation covers the obvious and not so obvious ways in which markets and businesses will adapt as a result. Let's jump right in. Let's talk about populism and elites and the various cycles they go through when we talk about sort of what you wrote about that topic. Yeah, sure. So like anytime there's a contentious topic, um, I like to have an object level opinion and then um, mostly talk about the meta stuff. So the meta thing is actually kind of interesting. So there there is this cycle sometimes where you'll have a country that is run by people who are just visibly part of the elite, like they're well educated, they they speak in whatever dialect is popular in the capital, they they know the right things to say, and they actually are really competent, like elites are good at what they do. But one of the problems that they have is that one of the things that they do is try to preserve their status as elites. So they kind of want things to move in a slow, measured, orderly way. And then um, every so often people get sick of it and they elect someone who is loud, flamboyant, has a blue collar accent, says a lot of crazy things. And um, economically, what that person does is they spend a lot of money. Um, They will do some combination of cutting taxes and increasing spending, but it's usually a bit of both. And what often happens in that cycle is that when the populists are in charge, GDP growth is usually pretty good for a while. And then if they're in charge for a really long time, the economy um, it becomes over indebted and there's too much cronyism and corruption and there's either wasteful investment or there's overconsumption and underinvestment or something something goes really badly and then things collapse and they put you know the country puts a like former professor or um, a different kind of nerd in charge of things and um, I think that that's actually like it, it's kind of a stabilizing mechanism because. If you look at, say, the U.S. and a lot of Western Europe in the post-financial crisis period, what you had was actually reasonably, like, at, at some level, reasonably competent government. There were you know, a lot of people who knew what they were doing and were very good at the, the granular basic stuff. But they also engineered this economy that was very slow growth and had very low interest rates and was just kind of stagnant. And stagnation is, if you are... Um, you know, you you went to the best schools and you got the best job um, stag- and, you know, all of your friends are in that cohort. Stagnation is really good for you because, you know, the people who will get your kids the best internships and who will write the good recommendation letters, etc. And you also know what path to put your kids on because it's the same path that you were on because nothing has changed. And that that is very much like a you know it's kind of like a vulgar marxist view of of elites and technocracy and things but it is directionally correct so i think that there's um, there's this nice cycle where you just veer back and forth between those and it actually works for for left populists and right populists because they're they're often pretty different in terms of social issues but pretty similar in terms of economic issues with the big difference being that the right populist thing to do is usually cut taxes and the left populist thing to do is usually raise spending. But in practice, they do a lot of both. And then there's this other meta thing where if you are a populist and you decide you're going to just start giving people money and you know doing like doing a lot of spending, you end up making the economy a lot more legible. So the, the populists end up figuring out how many people there are in this country, what their names are, where they live, et cetera, because that's the only way to send them all a check that will cause them to vote for you next time. And that means that now the technocrats actually have this much more legible economy where a lot more things make sense. They like basically the populists create this complicated economic machine. They add more dials and levers and meters and things. And then the, the technocrats just go to work, like tweaking everything just so. And it's it i don't think that there's really any avoidable way to do that like you know history has a lot of those kinds of cycles and epicycles and um it's also it, it it's kind of a broad a broad um category of populist or technocrat and you can quibble with that but i think you you do sort of know it when you see you really know it when you hear it like if you listen to a politician who's speaking your native language talk for like 15 seconds you can basically tell whether this person gets more vote, like gets um, a bigger majority among people who did not finish college or among people with PhDs. It's it's usually pretty easy to tell. And that's that's probably like, the I mean, that is kind of like a, a sort of um, class analysis. But in this case, the class analysis does actually matter. Like classes do exist and they do try to perpetuate themselves. And you um, you sort of you probably you don't want the world to be ruled by any one class for a really long time because that just leads to stagnation and over optimizing on things that that group cares about and under optimizing everything else but um 
you do so you, you do want some some turnover there there's going to be some some fuzziness about the categories but i think that's roughly how it works so if you if you are really upset that either your country is run by out of touch elites who don't care about the common man or your country is run by loud buffoons who are the common man in the worst way possible um, you know, give it a decade or two and there will be some crisis probably, or, or there can be kind of general turnover. It's like, it's one of the weird things that I was looking at when I was writing, writing this was that, um, the country that actually does this, like almost as a policy is Italy. They do this thing where every once in a while, everyone will admit that the country is completely screwed up and they will put a professor or a central banker or an economist or something in charge for a while. And, you know, the books get kept more, more accurately and everything, but this person is also just not an especially popular leader. And their, their mandate is like everyone, everyone with high name recognition we know is bad. And so we haven't heard of you, but you do seem competent. So you can be in charge for a while. And then we will kind of let, let our anger at the, the famous articulate, you know, famous and loud and charismatic people. We'll let that wear off a little bit and then we'll choose one to run things afterwards. Yeah. The, it's really interesting to, well, the term populism, is populism just democracy where you don't like the results? Like, Yeah, I, I mean, that is that is a useful shorthand. Is like, I believe in democracy, which is when my views are shared by 51% of the electorate. But I hate populism, which is when my views are shared by 49% or less of the electorate. Um, yeah. But no, there's, I think there's, there's a meaningful way to, there's a meaningful description of populism where it is, it is moving in the direction, like, it is like when there is a dispute between the very smart, well-informed, well-educated people who say the right things and just the average person, the populist sides with average person and the, the technocrat or elitist does not. And there was a there was a paper a while ago that was pointing out that like on a lot of issues, you the the upper class is actually pretty much like sensible libertarian ish but believes in a welfare state like they do tend to prefer more optimal tax systems and they're they're typically more tolerant on social issues and um they like the if you had a country ruled by just just the super rich it would be kind of you know close to what reason magazine or cato or like some somewhere between reason and cato because I, I know they are different but yeah somewhere somewhere between there and um you know those those organizations do make a lot of important and useful points but there are there are limitations to that worldview too yeah it, it's it's really interesting how multi-dimensional the sort of elite analysis is and also how um, much it's come up in the last few years especially since covid like people will look at someone like Sachs or elon and they'll say something like, hey, elites are out of touch or, or you know, elites are ruining this country or whatever. And, and they're referring to people in sort of media, academia, three-layer agencies, you know, government more broadly, this idea who are like claiming to represent the country or making decisions on behalf of the country, but they're either not making the right decisions or they're not making decisions that represent the actual views of, of, of the public in their eyes. Um, now, what they will say back is, first off, I'm poor. I'm a journalist. You're rich. You're a billionaire. How am I an elite and you're not? How are you not in right. this um, in this discussion? So which they might say, hey, well, David Sachs says, I might be a billionaire, but that's just one B. Whereas you know, you elites are collectively making decisions on behalf of this like five trillion dollar entity. Like it's it's way bigger than any individual um, billionaire. Like both sides are trying to claim as little power as possible in sort of the public mind to sort of either gain more sympathy or have more credibility when sort of attacking the group of people making decisions. But then these people will also say something like, hey, actually it's like big tech that has all the power. And if you notice, like Andreessen starts using this term little tech, like there, there is starting to be this sort of, you know, divide between big tech and little tech um, in terms of their views or stances on things or the type of people that, that go into them. And people claim that Elon was, and there's this Burnham analysis too, sort of, you mentioned class, like class warfare has emerged in, or strengthened in the Valley where CEOs have very different opinions. This happened a lot during BLM and DEI, like sort of the activism stuff for the last few years, employees clearly were on one side and CEOs were, were on the other. And um, it's funny because CEOs would complain about elites, but they're the ones being CEOs. So this way it's kind of multidimensional in this way. Yeah, I think there's a, there is a like I think the Burnham analysis is is pretty important. Where um, one way to think about it is that when an industry is new and volatile, founder CEOs tend to be pretty common because 
if you get things right, your return on capital is so high that you end up owning a material portion of the company that you start and being young enough to run it when you're also very, very wealthy. But as things get more established and stable and as returns on equity just converge to the Fortune 500 mean, um, it's just really hard. Like it's really hard to move up the ranks at uh, at General Motors and also have enough money to own five percent of General Motors. Like those are those are very very different paths, and you basically have to choose one. Like the closest you could get is you start some amazing. Like you could imagine some hypothetical world where someone who is like Elon but willing to sell his companies that he he sells Tesla to GM for stock and ends up owning 10% of GM and becomes their CEO in waiting and like that's but that is actually um part of like part of what happens with with rising elites is that they merge with the existing elite and they they end up becoming part of that elite and some of that it's just literally generational because it is like rich people marry high like people who got rich first generation marry people who have been high status for many generations that's been a, a long long-term trend and a long-term phenomenon and you can view that as like elites preserving their power and as people kind of trying to optimize for their grandkids well-being um by by nudging their kids in that direction and then yeah you can have in in the business world it's a more more literal you know more more financial merger but it is still like a merger of there's this um, this incumbent, they're big, they're established, they kind of know what they're doing, but they're starting to drift in the wrong direction. They haven't prioritized important things. And then there's a challenger who's growing really fast and is a huge threat to them directly. And sometimes they do end up joining forces and you know the challenger usually wants to be in charge in that situation. And the the older establishment still gets to preserve its, its purchasing power, but loses some share of status and loses a lot of control. And that's just something they kind of have to deal with. So there, that cycle is going to show up in at different time scales in different places. Like I'm sure there's like a smaller version of that cycle that happens even within like a trendy industry where you know in crypto, crypto has an establishment and it has you know these scrappy challengers who are doing other things and they they can end up having that same kind of intra elite conflict. And you know to your point on on Sachs and like all of these people complaining about elites while also being billionaires. There, you know, class class is something other than just rank ordering people by money. I think that, like, if you want to use money as an input into class, I would say that class is a function of your grandfather's net worth and of how prestigious your grandfather's job was. That is that is probably a better proxy for what I would think of as class. And so, in some cases, that means like you are an investment banker, just like your father and grandfather before you. And in other cases, it means like you are a journalist and your grandfather was an industrialist. But the only reason that you're a journalist is that your parents used some of their trust fund to give you a trust fund and also to pay your your West Village or Williamsburg or whatever rent. And that's the only way you can actually be able to afford to work in this um, high prestige but low pay kind of job. And, and universities are also going to be a pretty good status, uh, a pretty good proxy for this kind of social status. Um, like you can, you can view a lot of economic debates as um, the the first percentile fighting the 99th percentile among the same Ivy League graduating class, where it's always like the the person who went to a really good school and then got an internship at the New Republic and now they're a writer and um, one of their classmates went to that same really good school of course and then got an internship at Blackstone and is now flying around in their private jet so those people um, they hate each other because they know each other really well like they've they've talked to each other they've you know been drunk together at the same parties and things and they know that they have very different value systems but each one kind of feels like the other one should be more on board and so because they are so similar to each other relative to the rest of america the the differences that they do have are much more salient is it right to think of Sachs or elon as like counter elites i.e like a different group of powerful people that has a, a different set of views that is sort of contending for elite status I think so. And I think that there's, I think if they, if they acted less like they were simultaneously very, very wealthy, but also totally persecuted, um, they might actually find that that made them more powerful. If they were opposed to COVID lockdowns or something, and, and I guess Elon kind of did this, where he, his basic attitude was, you're just the governor. Why are you telling me how to run an actually important thing? Like, why are you telling someone with a real job what to do? <laughs> 
So I'm just going to show up at work and you can, you can find me if you feel like it. And I won't even look at the number when I'm signing the check because I know what the right thing to do. And I also know that I'm, I'm so important and powerful that I can get away with it. Like that is probably just a, like it's, it's better for their mental health and probably better for their power seeking. But it is also just you you do have to have the swagger to pull it off and there's i think nothing nothing more embarrassing than trying to act as if you are um slightly higher status than you really are and then getting called out on it like um and this i it, it, it has been a long time now but there i i did get this sense from uh dating in manhattan 10 years ago that people were really really looking for a way to find out if i was like if i was a finance guy because i had a back office job at chase or a finance guy because i was at a hedge fund and um so people are very sensitive to someone trying to signal slightly more status than they have especially in a context like that where it is this uh, just status seeking knife bite we'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors fast forward to the end of 2024 think about your goals what can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of succeeding? If learning a new language is on your list, you absolutely need to check out Babbel. Babbel offers a range of learning tools, self-study app lessons, live classes, and even podcasts, which have always been my favorite way to learn. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel isn't just a game to kill time and make you feel like you're learning a language. It's not overly academic or rigid either. It's all about learning language for the real world. Babbel stands out because it's designed by real people using a modern conversational teaching approach. It's not always easy, nothing worth doing ever is, but it's straightforward and designed to help you start speaking in just three weeks. With Babbel, I was able to brush up on my intermediate Spanish to ramp up for travel to Argentina last year and was able to set clear goals based on how much time each week I wanted to practice. Join millions of Babbel language learners across all age groups. Here's a special limited time offer for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash econ 102. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash econ 102, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash econ 102. Rules and restrictions may apply. If you don't already subscribe to Turpentine's industry-leading newsletters, like our new daily AI newsletter, Emergent Behavior, or Media Empires, you should. But that's not what I'm here to tell you about. The platform we use to power these newsletters is called Beehive, and it's excellent. First of all, it was started by the same early team who helped build Morning Brew into a $75 million newsletter business. And they built Beehive to offer that same powerful functionality to anyone sending emails. From essayists to business owners, the platform is beautiful, their text editor is intuitive, and they help you scale your audience with custom growth features. Beehive has powerful tools to help you monetize your content. You can easily launch paid subscriptions or pursue an advertising model. The Beehive platform will even connect you to premium brands to sponsor your newsletter. Not only do we use them, but thousands of the top newsletters in the world also use them, like Milk Road, Blockworks, The Lindy Newsletter, and so many more. Beehive's founder hooked up Moment of Zen listeners with a sweet deal. Get 20% off for three months with code MOZ. Visit beehive.com, that's B-E-E-H-I-I-V.com to get started. Feel free to not comment on this if this, if this is too controversial, but Israel is in a really interesting position where it's trying to win the PR war and, um, or, you know, or sort of convert, uh, I mean, both sides are trying to win, you know, win the PR war, but um, Israel is trying to, is having problems with young college students who are, uh, not sympathetic to the Israeli cause, right, um, in, in mass. And as a response, to, to simplify radically, they, they try to remind everybody of their victimization, of like, guys, do you remember all the things that Jews have been through and all the ways in which Israel has been victimized in, in the current sort of, uh, you know, series of conflicts? And yet it doesn't seem to be working, given the, given the existing power structure. And my uh, advice is to, like, find new narratives because it's only, like, angering people uh, because of the cognitive dissonance of weight, you're claiming all this, all this victimhood. And there's some parts of it that are certainly legitimate, but it, the outcomes don't seem to, you know, um, be in accordance with that. Yeah, I am. I am definitely not an expert on, um, 
you know, a, a propaganda, running a propaganda campaign. And I, I treat that term as morally neutral. Like propaganda is when you have a particular belief you're oh, trying yeah. to inculcate in other people and it's fine. Like propaganda was originally a, a term of self-description for a group in the Catholic church. They, there was like, there were correct thoughts and they needed more people to have them. And they needed a group of people for whom that was their KPI because, you know, nobody was really responsible for it. So anyway, treating propaganda as a neutral term, or maybe talking about narrative crafting or whatever, whatever euphemism is currently neutral and will be pejorative at some point in the future. Um, I do. So I think, especially if you're talking to American college students in the current year, um, if they are thinking in terms of overdogs and underdogs, and you are the overdog, you are losing that that particular fight. Uh, but they college students are incredibly deferential to powerful authority figures and rigorous hierarchy. They go to colleges, which um, there's this um, C friendly Randy Waldman post about um, how colleges are like the most reactionary institution in America today, where everyone knows exactly where they are in the pe picking order. You know how you are supposed to address different people within your department based on their seniority. They get personally offended if you don't address them correctly so it's like if you if you don't want to get shot at and you don't want to take vows of poverty or chastity but you do want to be able to just rip someone to shreds for addressing you by the wrong title and being insufficiently groveling when they email you and ask you for something um you should try to become a, a professor so and college students are actually they're very very tolerant of this strict hierarchical you know court of versailles kind of environment as long as you don't tell them that's what it is if you told them that College is, you know, this this um, this very elitist thing that is trying to grade everyone and trying to create like a a class of nobility with special privileges, and that you if you join this you get to have special privileges compared to the people who are just not not as worthy as you. Um, they would be disgusted by that and they wouldn't want to do it. So as long as you don't bring it up, it's fine. And so maybe, uh, yeah, I think. And to the to the extent that that's that you're optimizing for that kind of PR slash propaganda victory, just treating it as like it's a done deal. The decision has been made. And, you know, the question is how soon and at what cost do we accomplish our policy goals, um, and, which is also, I think, pretty much correct. Like there's there's not really a viable way for Hamas to militarily achieve its goals. And then there is a question of. Like you can view the this process as just an extremely brutal negotiation, which it really you know it is, um, and and that um, you know that's that's really horrifying to think about. But people are in the middle of it; they have to actually make choices, and there's a set of choices that they make that causes the people they're charged with protecting makes them worse off. And you know there's a set of priorities that that different groups have, and um, there's. It's hard to think of an equitable solution like this. This is really not a case where everyone just, you know, they they write down exactly what they want and what they tolerate, and then you run some kind of, um, you know, second price auction process or whatever, and everyone's surplus is maximized, and you know, like. Israel gets the West Bank, but the Palestinians get billions of dollars, and then they all leave. Like th that, that kind of it can't happen on that kind of basis. There's uh, there's a lot more at work than just trying to maximize utility for for everybody involved. So um, yeah, it ends up just being a really depressing situation. But yeah. I think that's roughly how it works. The Substack Gray Mirror, um, written by Curtis Sharvin, has a blog post called "Big Tech Has No Power at All." And so I, 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 I not burn, I recommend people uh, read that article if they're interested in this topic. Um, but the question I'll pose from it is, who do you think has more power? And we have to describe what power means. In this case, I'll describe around sort of like disseminating specific, let's say, political causes. Um, the New York Times or Facebook? If, if you were in charge of Facebook, the New York Times, given sort of the limitations that both organizations have or the special access that both organizations have, who do you think really tells who? either what to do or could, you know, sort of disseminate uh, a specific propaganda to, to use your... Yeah, yeah. No, I, I would much, much rather be the hereditary monarch of the New York Times than to be the the founder of Facebook from that perspective, from that power maximizing perspective. Uh, Facebook's a way better business. But anyway, New York Times, you know, Facebook, Facebook can alter political opinions, but less so the opinions of people who really matter. So there's like, I guess you can you can borrow the Chomsky model where the media set this range of debate and they enforce a lively debate within this narrow range. And so Facebook can decide 
to some extent whether the good arguments or bad arguments from any given side get presented, but only within that range. And then the New York Times, like the readers, the core reader of the New York Times is not someone who is clicking on an article because they saw it on their Facebook newsfeed. And if the Times runs ads, like the Wall Street Journal, I think used to run ads in the Facebook newsfeed. I don't know that they still do, but the point of those ads is not we're arbing the cost gap between here's what we pay for a, a click from Facebook and here's our CPM for the ads on this article. Um, that would be a money losing proposition. It is we're targeting people who are going to subscribe to the journal, read it, like open the journal app before they open Facebook. And we want to get the people who are not opening social media apps first thing. Um, we want the people who are reading the news first thing and kind of getting getting this more structured, considered official opinion where it's more human based than algorithm based, or at least humans have the the final input into what the front page looks like. Um, and that is that is just a better tool for for shaping elite opinion. Um, there is a reason that when people make a lot of money in in some unrelated business and cash out, they don't try to buy, you know, the fourth biggest social network in the United States. They try to buy the 15th biggest magazine, the 15th biggest current events and politics magazine instead. In fact, like, I guess that's like uh, the, the cleanest way to look at that would be the New Republic because it was a Facebook co-founder. So he made his money and then he made his money in social media, but he didn't want money as much as he wanted influence. So he bought, he sold the he you know he stepped away from the social network and bought the magazine so i think yeah that is um that is kind of like a a knockdown argument against the idea that social networks swing elections in meaningful ways it's like you'd expect it to be the other way around you'd expect it to be like the Sulzberger ox family sells out you know sells the new york times to a russian oligarch and uses that money to buy enough facebook stock that they can demand a board seat which it would not be enough money unless you get a really good oligarch but anyway like if if social networks were the were relatively better for power than for money that's what you'd expect but they're relatively better for money than power and so social networks they will like zuckerberg will sometimes just you know dip into the petty cash jar and start flinging stacks of hundred dollar bills at journalists and you know hoping that it will hit someone the right way and they will do things that actually shift the elite narrative and it doesn't really work yeah the the flip side of course so I agree with everything you just said. At the same time, Elon did buy Twitter. Um, yes. You know, if he... He did buy Twitter. He shifted certain parts of the dialogue. Twitter is actually a special case yeah. because Twitter is just this... This um, I heard it described recently as the the communications bus for the for different departments on in the executive branch. Mm. So if you were doing something, if you're in the Department of Agriculture and you're doing something involving agriculture, there's there's someone in that department you can talk to, you know who they are, et cetera. But if you are trying to do something that also involves the Department of Energy, you know, maybe, maybe there's something involving fertilizer, but you know, the fertilizer needs lots of natural gas. Maybe we need to, you know, maybe we, we don't want that particular LNG terminal built. So we have more natural gas here. So we can get the fertilizer here or whatever it is. Um, you don't necessarily know who to talk to and where the leverage is. And so apparently the old way it used to work was those things all had to go up to the president and then back down through the org chart. And president is a busy guy. And um, it's just really hard to get something onto onto his agenda. Um, but now Twitter is kind of a way that, you know, some, and I, I, my pushback against that, that argument, the communications bus argument was that probably the, the Washington post and more recently Politico, that's also a way that you communicate intra department right. and, it's a it's a way that you test out ideas. You know, you you float an idea. It's not attributed to anybody in particular, but insiders know it could be only one of n people, and you know, of those n people, one of them actually wants to do this. So, like, insiders know, and that actually gives them a little bit of political, like, a little bit of social capital that they can share these these cool little tidbits with people. So it is actually like injecting liquidity into the DC rumor mill status competition, et cetera, money supply. Um, but anyway, you like, you do that, you see what the reaction is. And then if the reaction works well, if the reaction is the one you want, then you, you go public with this and say, oh yeah, that's, that's my thing now. And if it's a negative reaction, then you, you know, to the extent that rumors get back that it was you pushing for, you know, we're going to, I don't know, like, dig a giant trench and just separate Florida from the rest of America because we don't like them anymore. You can be like, no, no, we would never do that. That's a totally spurious rumor. And um, it's silly that you would even ask. Um, this this dynamic actually does show up online with um, pseudonymous people who like test out different personas. And then when one of those personas works, they run with it and it gets big enough that they can um, 
they can either withstand the blowback or just, you know, their, their sub stack or podcast or whatever is making enough money that they don't have to care. And then they can go public and have their real name attached to it. So there, there are echoes of these in, in different contexts, but yeah, with, with Elon and Twitter, um, I mean, some of it was just Elon really likes Twitter and there were complaints he had about how it worked. And he decided the most convenient way to fix that was um, just buying the company, which is kind of analogous, I think, to like if you um, this happens from time to time where someone makes a ton of money, they buy a really nice house, they realize, well, I don't really like having neighbors. I like pr my privacy. Why don't I buy the $10 million house next to me and the $15 million house on the other side, demolish them, and then I'll have privacy. And paying $25 million for privacy is not something I would do, but paying, you know, 0.1% of my net worth or something in order to have exactly the life, you know, exactly the home life that I want is actually a really good deal. Yeah. So he, he did that to a larger degree, but Elon just, he always bets a larger share of his bankroll on the things that other people, things of that nature that other people do. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because the counter case and an example that's brought up in the piece is, is Jeff Bezos and Washington Post where he bought it, but it doesn't seem like he was really able to change the politics of it. And they were actually, it seems like even critical or negative of Amazon. And what I wonder, and he's, he's saying that as another example of like, just how tech people have no power. But I wonder if that's just a, you know, not to put Bezos down, but a, a failure of courage. Whereas like if Elon bought the Washington Post or if Elon bought the New York Times, I suspect he could do something similar to what he did with Twitter, which is just like repeal, re re repeal, replace and change the political orientation of it. And it would still remain high status. Curtis disagrees. Um, I, I suspect if Bezos bought the New York Times, nothing would change either. Even it, it's, But I, I think it maybe don't, only takes a special kind of CEO who can really pull that off. And maybe it's just Elon for now. There is a different context if you're buying a journalistic organization versus buying a buying a, a platform. So you can, there, there are going to be plenty of people who can write, I don't know, write the algorithms that detect abusive speech. And those people will have a variety of political views. You can look at their GitHubs. You can talk to them about what they worked on and get a sense of, could this person do the job? And they may have done a job that is not at all related to that, except they were ingesting a bunch of data that was unstructured and applying particular rules for it. So, you know, you, you could end up hiring like a former quant or something. Um, and with, with journalism though, you, if you want to change the, change the party line among the journalists, you actually have to find people who are good writers and can write at the same quality that the, the publication has previously had, but are also going to write with your slant. And if you replace 10%, you know, if you, you buy the New York Times and replace 10% of the writers with staffers from pro-Trump media organizations, now you have accidentally fired 90% of your staff and you've, you have saved money on severance, but everybody else is just going to quit. They're not going to want to work with these people. So um, what you can try to do, and I think we talked about this a little bit with the, the BuzzFeed Vivek thing, which is, you know, it is kind of a fantasy because of the, the corporate structure of BuzzFeed. Like there is super voting stock, like you can't actually take it over. You can, you can buy a bunch of stock and write them mean letters that do have to get posted to the SEC website. So it is just, uh, is basically the 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 wealthy man's equivalent of buying the blue check in order to get better distribution is you buy 5% of the company. So everybody sees your open letter. Um, so, but yeah, if, if you, if you tried to replace everything wholesale, that wouldn't work. Um, you might be able to do some kind of frog boiling thing where as people quit their jobs, you replace them with centrists until you have a centrist organization. And then as the centrists quit, you replace them with conservatives and then you have a conservative organization. But you also, um, there's just less of a conservative, you know, there's not, there's less of a conservative minor league of people who um, can can find an economically viable way to do really, really good journalism from that perspective. So since we're mentioning extremely controversial online writers, I will note that the person who wrote the best article on this it is thoroughly well cited. It is well argued and it is him trashing conservatives is Richard Hanania, who has a wonderful piece called conservative or liberals read conservatives watch TV. And it is, there's just an astonishing amount of evidence that that is true, that that is where where conservatives get a lot of their information about the state of the world, that liberals get a lot of their information from the New York Times and from long form text and things like that. And so there's just less of a market for really thoughtful, long, long form conservative writing. And there are plenty of people who do it 
on their own because they actually believe in it and care about it. Um, and some of them have recently done well. Like there's been a lot of um, very just well-executed conservative investigative journalism because there were just a lot of really easy targets and a lot of people who just should have uh, should have done their plagiarism more carefully and um, they were just easy to easy to spot and you could put together some really damning stuff. But then even then, there have been there have been some of those pieces where they they kind of overplay their hand where there are cases of pretty egregious plagiarism and then there are cases where it just it doesn't seem to matter that much like it didn't didn't really make a difference here it was just it was more sloppy than someone wholesale stealing someone else's work and taking credit for it um like i still think that's bad but i think i think there's like a there are kind of degrees of plagiarism and a lot of it does come down to did you steal the core thesis you had from someone else or did you steal a random phrase, which you may have just like literally you have your stack of books that are sort of, you know, reference material. You read this sentence and then you are typing a summary of what happened. And because the sentence is in your head, you end up using similar words, similar turns of phrase. Like I've seen this in books where I know the author did an enormous amount of legwork and did really like did the right thing. There's um, there is a line in the Warren Buffett biography, The Snowball, that is a direct but unsighted, I believe, quote from the Roger Lowenstein book, Buffett, Making of American Capitalist. And I read that book and reread it obsessively as a teen. So I remember a bunch of phrases from it. And so when I read The Snowball, there was a phrase that popped out. It's like, this is straight from the other book. It was copied, but I don't think it, I, I, there's no reason that someone would write a deeply researched 800 page book that was so well researched that it ruined her relationship with her source, where she used to be the one in the, the one financial analyst Buffett trusted and respected who covered Berkshire. And now he, he doesn't want to speak to her again because um, she she mentioned that in the 70s, he and Catherine Graham were clearly having an affair um, or at least very probably having an affair or at least very willing to act like they were. Um, Anyway, I, I don't think someone would spend years writing an 800 page book about the person she respected the most and then just plagiarize. I think it's very easy to do that kind of thing on, uh, accidentally. So anyway, um, there, there are some conservative investigative journalists who do that. There are some people who write good long form things and are conservative, but they all have to have day jobs, which means they just don't have as much time to perfect their craft. So the you know conservative blogger who's been writing little opinion pieces on on um, on their blog or on Substack for years, but has also been working as a software engineer or something, they just have way fewer hours of practice than the person who went to journalism school and has spent the last two years at Vox and you know like spent two years at Vox and then a year at the New York Times. Like that person has been writing for fewer years but more minutes, and they are probably going to be better at it. So you, you end up like, if you want to take that angle, you actually have to start planning a generation in advance. And, um, there's, you know, semi-fortunately that, that has happened, like semi-fortunately for just having vigorous debate and not having one side massively outgunned in terms of writing things that elites will read. Like the Koch brothers do give pretty, uh, did give pretty generously in the past to, um, basically stipends to conservative journalists. And, um, that, that did mean that there were a lot of people who were doing more writing than they otherwise would have getting more practice at it. But it is, um, it's just really hard to replace that entire infrastructure in any reasonable amount of time. If there's like a really ambitious 15 year old listening right now, <laughs> who is going to like design their entire career around this, then maybe by the time they're 65, they can look back on everything that they've accomplished in their life and say, well, the media are still very progressive. There's, it's still mostly written by single people in large cities who went to elite schools and have very different values from the average person, but you know, do have like this set of values. But, now that I've spent my entire life working on this, um, it is at least more plausible that someone in the next generation will be able to create like a large centrist publication that elites read because it's good, even though they disagree with a lot of the content. Like you do have The Economist, but The Economist is like left, you know, center left on social issue, on most social issues, center right on most economic issues. And that's like the closest you get to the, uh, the, the I think, conservative media that elites would read that would like where if you wrote an article on topic X and someone in the state, someone in the state department would read it and actually potentially change their mind on topic X, or at least spend some time thinking about it. Yeah, I, I want to make sure we cover uh, a few a few other topics here. So I, I want to seg segue that this is a great conversation. I, I want to get to uh, Leopold Aschenbrenner's situational awareness paper, situational awareness paper. Why don't you talk about what you found so interesting in, in what he wrote? 
Yeah, so it's it's a good paper making the case that we are we are potentially like not certainly. He doesn't say it's absolutely going to happen. He says there there is a reasonable case to be made that in the next few years we will have artificial intelligence that is much smarter than humans and things get much crazier after that. Um, and so part of the paper is walking through that. And the way I think about it is, okay, he, his core point is if you look at this chart, it is a straight line because the Y axis is logarithmic. That means this is a process that's going really, really fast. It's going like a freight train and it's exponential or not, not strictly exponential, but it's, it is super linear and not slowing down. And if you look at a chart like that, the way I think about it is if you are taking it um, literally, you just keep extrapolating a couple of years. But if you're taking it seriously, the first question to ask is, why isn't this graph vertical? Like if this is possible and definitely gonna happen, what stops it from happening right now? And he does talk through some reasons for that, like um, running running out of unique tokens. Um, I've been joking a lot that the Vesuvius project just shows you how much money people will spend to get a few tokens that are not in the OpenAI or Gemini training set already. Um, but it also there there are power constraints; those may be relaxed. Like there's there's not really there, there, I think I think there is actually a a physical limit to how many flops per watt you can get. But it is um, we're we're not there yet. Um, but there there are these power limits, and if you kind of extrapolate all of these things, what you get to is that um, by the end of the 2020s, the US would need to devote like one third of its entire electricity supply to um, to training the, the biggest, best model. And the really clever synthesis he makes, I think this is like the, the, the most important thing he says in this piece is the model training and model inference, those require a lot of power as the models gets, get more powerful, they, they will need to use more electricity. Um, China is better at building power plants than America. China has added as much power as America consumes total in in the space of I think like a, a decade, like a little over a decade or something, something in that range, that that order of magnitude. And the the, uh, the phrase order of magnitude shows up a lot in that essay. It makes me feel really good about getting some number, you know, accidentally doubling some number or, or cutting it in half. Like if we're mostly focusing on ooms, then that is just you know doesn't even rise to the level of ty typographical error. Anyway, so. Um, China can can generate more electricity, and China could also just say, "Okay, the lights in Chengdu are going out for now because we would rather train a model, and you'll just have to suck it up." Um, America can't like do that to Portland or something. Just say, like, "We're we're turning off the power in this city because we want to train GPT seven. Um, but the the weights and the process of training the model, a lot of that exists. Like the weights are just. They are their software. They're, they're a long list of numbers. You can put them on a USB drive and you can put a USB drive in your pocket, get on a plane, take that plane from the United States to China, plug it into a computer there. And now China has a state of the art model that they have not had to train, but they can use for inference. And he, he's, he basically says the labs don't actually view that as a major threat model. They are thinking like startups. They're not thinking like the Manhattan Project in terms of the security profile, but you should, you know, you should think more like beyond what the Manhattan Project did, because of course it was also infiltrated by communists, and um, they did actually steal the secrets, and they did end up building exactly that technology just a few years after the U.S. So you want to do better than the Manhattan Project. Um, the U.S. probably does not have that state capacity. So when he talks about nationalizing the labs, I, um, I think that that is probably much well. I don't know. There, there are smart. There are a lot of smart security people in the U.S. government. Security is a really hard problem. I don't know who actually does it better. Like I, I, I genuinely, I would, I would guess that if you have something that you want to store digitally and keep it secret forever, but have it accessible to the right person, probably the NSA would do a better job than most private sector organizations. On the other hand. Coinbase has that. They do that. They have not gotten hacked yet, and um, so so maybe maybe that would be maybe you like shard the 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 secret and you give part of it to Coinbase and part of it to the NSA and I don't know part of it to whoever at Meta is responsible for making sure that Jeff Bezos's WhatsApp account doesn't get hacked again and part of it to whoever's responsible for making sure that no one is ever going to read I don't know Sergey Brin's Gmail from twenty years ago or, or something like that. So. Um, there, there are entities out there that have a very serious security posture, but none of them are the the major independent AI labs. So his scenario is basically, 
we do invent super intelligence. We can generate 100 million John von Neumanns, but those 100 million John von Neumanns all uh, are really big fans of Xi Jinping thought. And then the world ends with a Chinese communist takeover because they were better at industrial espionage than we were at defensive industrial espionage, and they were better at building power plants than we are. Kind of a nightmare. <laughs> um, and there's there's a lot to question on that, but um, as with a lot of other existential risk things, like you can you can quibble about a lot of the details, but you should take seriously the the idea that humanity can make a series of mistakes that wipe us out, and some of those are in many cases those are errors of omission. It's things we could have done that we didn't do, not things we did that we shouldn't have. Yeah, the I'm curious to your perspective on the other thing Leopold's doing in terms of his fund idea, which is. If you were taking AGI, like his ideas about AGI's timing and sort of what that means as, or the future sort of AI development as given, how would your, what investing strategy would you sort of present or follow in accordance with that? Yeah. And I think, I think he's basically doing it the right way. Like, I, I guess if, if people at the major labs think that AGI is coming, it's coming soon and whoever gets it first wins because now they can create as many AI researchers as they want. They just have to, you know, pay for, for electricity. Um, I think it, in that, in that kind of dynamic, there's a really, um, there's a race and it probably makes more sense to optimize for training the next model versus optimize for not needing to, needing to rely on NVIDIA. And you even want to be careful about things like if you're designing your own inference chips, does NVIDIA at some point say, Everyone who's not designing their own chips gets a GP, gets GPUs, and whoever's designing their own chips gets zero new GPUs. So you can run really, you know, really cost-effective inference on last generation's model, but you're not actually going to build the next generation model. So I think that people um, at the major lab, and this is something that NVIDIA has done really well, is they've made sure that there is no one lab that can tell NVIDIA, take it or leave it, but NVIDIA can tell any one of those labs, take it or leave it. And it's, it's not a completely existential risk, but in their framing where we are we're thinking in terms of years but we'll be thinking in terms of months in not too long um it does become an existential risk if you don't get the next generation of gpus so um that in that in that model yeah you'd want to invest heavily in nvidia i'm not sure what else the fund does like i don't know if you can charge two and 20 for we're putting 85 percent of our money into nvidia and the other 15 goes into call options on nvidia um, <laughs> That is yeah. is the SV uh, like the, the 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 popular allocation. Um, I was I was in the Bay Area um, over the weekend, and uh, there were a lot of uh, a lot of people who did very well on Nvidia, and especially on Nvidia call options. Segwaying a little bit, but relatedly, you had a, a segment of post where you talked about how you think about VC and its its role. Um, or in terms of what purpose it serves as it relates to the sort of the, the bid ask spread. Um, yeah. Why don't you unpack that? Yeah. So the idea here is that um, there are a, a small set of things that trade in markets and they're important things like the price of money or the price of oil or gold or whatever. But most things don't. In most cases, like you can't buy and sell futures or options on things like what's my income going to be next year? Is Austin housing price or Austin housing price is going to go up or down? Or what's the volatility look like? Like in, in most cases, those markets don't exist, don't clear. And it's hard to create new markets. And for most companies, there's not going to be a lively market in that company. So if you bought 5% of a restaurant your friend is starting and then you change your mind and want to sell it, it's not like if you bought, you know, a, a, if you spent a similar money, amount of money on shares of McDonald's where you are, you know, you you have basis points of slippage when you exit that position. No, like you, you should probably either try to sell that stake back to your friend and maybe you won't be such good friends anymore, or you should just mentally write it down to zero and say like, it is like, it would literally the the cost in terms of my time is literally higher than the value of this investment if i were to try to sell it um and that's like for the majority of businesses that's that's fine and that's how it should be people shouldn't be constantly trading little pieces of businesses all the time there's really no point um because that those transaction costs are so high but you can you can think of vcs as trying so like there, there's this model where you raise one round in order to get to the point where you can raise the next round and so on until you get to the point where you don't have to raise any more money. And you could also view the VCs as trying to narrow the bid ask spread at any given stage, like narrow the range of plausible uh, valuations for this business, because the larger investors are, the more they are thinking about downside and also just thinking like putting some parameters around their portfolio, asking not just like, am I investing in a cool thing? And does this founder seem smart and charming, but also things like, 
what is the, dis, the what is the present value of the discounted cash flows that this business will generate? So you can you can think of VCs as trying to turn money into legibility and then monetize that legibility by selling their stock once it appreciates. And then the the corollary to that is. Well, the, the amount of data becoming available is is rising really fast. There are just a whole lot more APIs than there used to be. You can pull a lot more data. Um, there are a whole lot more ways that you can just um, you know, dump all of your Stripe transactions into, into a file. And someone who looks at that has a pretty good idea of what your business is, how it works, et cetera. Um, and there are a lot more tools for taking messy, unstructured data and turning it into something you can actually put a number on. So we might, ex we sh we might expect that there will be a lot more companies you can buy a stake in or particular kinds of things you can hedge and bet on, et cetera. But really the it's it's tough to be too specific about that. But the main the main takeaway for me was as AI gets more powerful, the financial services industry share of GDP will rise surprisingly fast. And we can end up with an economy where a whole lot of human labor is actually allocating capital and not, you know, doing things because um, there's, there is just a lot of value in making sure if there's, um, you know, if there's abundance of money and scarcity of opportunity, it's extremely valuable to funnel, funnel money into the, the right opportunities. Let's segue to high frequency trading. What is yeah, that? Yeah. So this is like kind of, kind of on that note. So there's this, uh, really fun piece from a, uh, quant researcher at a high frequency trading firm. He actually also wrote a really good piece on high frequency trading like 10 or 15 years ago. And, um, it's just a really good guide to what do they do? How do they think? Like, if you are doing this for fun on your own, how do you, how do you do this? And then how do, how do actual firms do this when they're doing it for serious? Um, and he's, he's claiming that there is actual social utility in what high frequency traders do that, um, the, like, even in the, the latency competition of, we are going to get our packet to the, um, to the server, just a you know tiny, tiny fraction of a second, second faster than our competitors. What he says is like, this is all part of the information transmission mechanism that we use to set prices. And he makes the really important point that the lower your latency is, the more liquidity you can afford to offer, because the reason you don't want to offer too much liquidity is if something changes and you don't react fast enough, you get run over. You have, um, you've put in a stale quote and someone trades against you and you really wish they didn't. The faster you can react, the less the um, the less risk there is in stale quotes, and so you can actually afford to offer more liquidity. And then then we get to the standard, you know, why does liquidity matter? Liquidity matters because the lower the cost of entering and exiting a trade is, the more it pays to look for inefficiently priced assets. And the more efficiently priced every asset is, the more we actually know about not just the value of companies today, but also the more we know about the impact of real world events on the value of those companies. And that's that's really useful information to have. Like it is like the most useful thing you can tell a CEO after a presentation they give is, hey, while you were talking, your stock went down 7%. Like it was here when you opened your mouth, it was way down here when you stopped talking. So everyone with skin in the game thinks that whatever you said was a really, it was not what they wanted you to say. Um, it's really useful to get that kind of feedback. And, um, and people will say that the you know buybacks exceed primary issuance. So like the market is more of a mechanism for returning corporate capital to investors than raising corporate capital, like raising capital for growth from investors. Um, that is somewhat true, but in tech where so much compensation is equity based, um, it's, it is actually allocating capital because it's allocating human capital and human capital is the most important capital that most of these firms have. Um, that may not be true. Um, you know, as, as their CapEx rises faster than headcount, there is a point at which, you know, Microsoft is like a pile of very, very valuable GPUs with a handful of engineers scurrying around on top and doing things. But for now, these companies are made of people, their value value is people. And so when you talk about the capital allocation problem, what you're really talking about is if Microsoft is actually winning an AI, and by the way, I'm long Microsoft, I don't think they're like the ultimate winner in AI, but they're doing a pretty good job. If Microsoft is winning an AI and the stock price goes up, that convinces more people that Microsoft is a lucrative place to work. It moves talent towards the company that's doing the best job of actually deploying this marvelous new technology. And that is a, an enormous social good. Yeah. I, uh, and then next time I also makes the point, which I really, really, really liked, of, um, even if you had a completely planned economy, you would have people doing exactly this thing of minimizing the latency with which important information gets transmitted to the people who make those decisions. They would have different different job titles. They might be optimizing, a, you know, they'd be optimizing a very different system, but they would still be trying to figure out how do we identify the most important bit of information? How do we identify the, the recipient who will get the most value from getting it? And then how do we get that bit to that person? at the speed of light. Yeah. And 
the the hope of prediction markets is that we can mimic that. Yes. And there are limitations to that, which actually get back to the whole, you know, who wants to trade against you. And in prediction markets, it's just way more likely that you have inside information. So um, you get liquidity on things where everyone has an opinion and no one will make up their mind and everyone's really biased and people like to gamble, which is basically national elections at sports. Um, it is just harder to have an informative prediction market about things like how much better will the next NVIDIA chip be? Because the person who bets in size is someone who either works there and has that information or talk to someone who told them something that they really shouldn't have. So um, it becomes it becomes kind of hard to hard to make a robust market in those kinds of things, but you can get kind of close and even the approximations are worth something. Thanks for listening to The Riff. Please go follow and subscribe, give us five stars, and check out Burns' excellent newsletter, The Diff, if you haven't already. 